the light. <laughs> we, we got lost in the park. I got lost in the park on the way up here. So um, thanks very much to my organizers, um, co-organizers, and uh, also want to uh, acknowledge the various funding sources for this. What I'm going to try to do today is to raise some challenges rather than providing answers for the most part. Uh, and following up to some extent on Daniel's lecture, uh, I want to specifically explore the role that mathematics and physics might play uh, because that's what this institute was set up for, but also especially suggest the, the potential benefits of an ecological and an evolutionary perspective, and in turn, the fact that ecologists and evolutionary biologists um, are learning the power of, of studying microbial systems as the way to get at some of the general questions um, of, of interest. So, across a wide range of systems, so that you can see the I thought I had it all shut off here. Um, so on the upper left you see uh, starlings over Rome, plus if you look carefully one hawk. Um, but the examination of systems, whether they're physical systems like um, magnetization or, or whether they're uh, biofilms or whether they are systems of vertebrates, in all of these systems there's interest in understanding how macroscopic patterns might emerge from microscopic details, largely independent of some of those details. And so in the scaling problem, one has to try to determine what are the details that are important at the microscopic level. Um, so like these examples, microbial communities are complex adaptive systems. It's a term you're going to hear a lot of. Uh, Karina said that's what she works on, which is true. Uh, this means systems that are made up of individual agents who interact with each other and based on those interactions, there are emergent patterns. So there are problems that go on multiple scales. There are conflicts that go on on multiple scales. There's complementary function, as you heard right at the end of Daniel's talk. And we want to understand how those um, macroscopic patterns are emergent from the microscopic interactions, and indeed not just the microbial communities, but the broader ecosystems of which they are part. Now in physics, whether we're dealing with pressure or changing temperature or the like, statistical mechanics developed that thermodynamics as a way to understand how we, could underst how we can describe the broader macroscopic properties in terms of large numbers of individuals um, smashing into each other. And it's much easier in physics than it is for biological systems where there are highly nonlinear interactions. So that means we have to find ways to scale, to um, relate phenomena across scales from cells to organisms, from organisms to groups of organisms, all the way up to ecosystems and the biosphere. And if I were talking to a different audience, I would include the social and economic systems in which the biological systems are embedded. And to ask questions like, and you'll hear a lot about this this week, how robust are the properties of Ecosystem. How does the robustness of those macroscopic properties relate to things that are going on on much finer scales, the ecological and evolutionary dynamics, and to ask if we can develop a nonlinear statistical mechanics of microbial systems and of the ecosystems of which they are part? Um, my former postdoc, Andrew Hein, my current postdoc, George Hagstrom, Roman Stocker, um, at ETH, who many of you know, and his group have a fairly recent grant from the Science Foundation, which asks, um, how do we derive macroscopic equations for all of these things, like the interaction rates, from individual-based models of ecological interactions? One of the most successful efforts, in my opinion, to do that is from Mick Follows and his group at uh, MIT, the work uh, in, in particular with Penny Chisholm, uh, in which he's, his group has derived the sorts of equations Daniel suggested to us for nutrients, phytoplankton, and zooplankton in the ocean to try to describe the, the macroscopic dynamics of the ocean using standard uptake functions and things of that sort, and then putting lots of types into competition, doing 
rather crude um, evolutionary competition uh, just to sort it out and see what's left at the end. And these models have been remarkably successful in predicting not where individual species will be, but where what they call ecotypes, uh, groups of species across the planet. These models work very well. And we and others have been working and MIG has a large number of collaborations in order to try to put these into an evolutionary framework to understand the dynamics. Um, and this is a paper that George Hagstrom and I uh, just published at Ecosystems. And I want to focus on these or do I need that? <laughs> on these features, which is understanding marine ecosystems as complex adaptive systems. And these, the three things after the colon are the things I want to focus on. Emergent patterns, critical transitions, and public goods problems, which you heard from Daniel at the end of his lecture. Now, there's been a large increase in agent-based models. The increase in computational power uh, is very seductive. We can build models in which you can look at individuals and give them all the rules you want. That's the great advantage of these models. It's the, also the great disadvantage because the models are too complex. You don't really know what's going on. You don't know how robust the outcomes are. Uh, they've been used for bird flocks, for fish schools, for those reindeer that you see at the bottom in which individuals are simply following other individuals and wonderful emergent patterns come out. And they can be used in microbial communities. But one has to be very careful because ultimately, especially in this building, one ought to be uh, trying to use those as ways to get at reduced dimensional descriptions, either using well-trodden methods like hydrodynamic limits or moment closure techniques, as were often used in statistical mechanics, or the newer data-driven equation-free methods that my colleague Giannis Kevakidis and others have been developing, or other approaches to aggregation. But ultimately, we ought to be taking those agent-based models and collapsing them into much uh, smaller dimensional sets of equations that help us uh, understand what's going on. So there are a number of theoretical questions I want to raise, especially having to do with the microbiome. And this is where I think the great challenge um, my group has been starting to interact with Marty Blazer's group at NYU and Jal Xavier's group at Sloan Kettering to look at questions of this sort. Can we understand the macroecology, which is a term from ecology, of the microbiome? That is, how are things distributed within the body and across regions? Um, how do you measure the diversity of the microbiome community? What's the importance of uh, neutral theory? Uh, uh, which got its start in population genetics, but it has become popular since Steve Hubble's book in ecological theory as well. Or has everything got a purpose there? An important ecological notion is of competitive release. That is, you eliminate one competitor and something else uh, spreads. Can we help to understand the microbiome and medical treatment of it uh, using ecological theory? For example, Heavy uses of antibiotics often attacks many organisms, but, but not C. difficile, which often uh, goes into outbreak in individuals that have had, um, have had treatments with antibiotics. What about the ecosystem dimensions of the, of the human body and the microbiome? Nutrient cycles, you just heard this in the last few slides from Daniel. Um, H. pylori, I'll come back and talk about in just a moment, but this was a specialty of Marty Blazer. H. pylori is declining in the human population, which he thinks is a bad thing. So you may know H. pylori has been associated with ulcers and with stomach cancer, but Blazer's hypothesis is it's actually protective against esophageal cancer. So what's going on in terms of our microbiomes? By the way, I recommend his book, to those of you who hadn't seen it, called Missing Microbes, in which he argues that heavy use of antibiotics and cesarean sections has reduced the diversity of um, our microbiomes and caused outbreaks of, or, or rises in things like asthma, esophageal uh, reflux, um, obesity, um, et cetera. What about 
the theory of biological evasion is very well developed. Uh, and the role of probiotics. I take a probiotic every morning. I don't know what I'm doing. Uh, there's no theory of, uh, associated with it. How many organisms uh, is one introducing? And what is the theory associated with the dynamics of, uh, of the community in relationship to the things that you introduce uh, through probiotics or, of course, what's received more attention, antibiotics? Uh, and can we understand these communities in terms of their ecosystem properties and how those evolve? So these are the four topics I want to focus on. First of all, temporal patterning. In an ecological theory, uh, com uh, community, or I should say a traditional ecological community, like a forest community, um, one understands that disturbances occur all the time, that when those disturbances occur, certain species that you see on the left there begin to come in uh, to occupy space. They get a, um, replaced by those who are not as vagil in getting there, but are better competitors which in turn are replaced by the others that are more down the spectrum until you get to the competitive dominance at the end that take their time getting there. This is a standard secondary successional pattern. Do those successional patterns exist in the microbiome? For sure they do. But what do we know about patterns of colonization and succession in the microbiome? So that's why I said at the beginning I wanted to raise questions, and in microbial communities more generally. What about daily cycles and other cycles? What about like seasonality? Um, what can we say about those? Now, there are two different ways to think about um, the, um, whoa, you okay, Bruce? Like this one, a little attention? <laughs> uh, what was I talking about, anybody remember? <laughs> different ways to think about what's going on in, in terms of uh, ecosystem structure and function. Uh, one is the, uh, the issue that I'll come back to at the end that Daniel touched on, the notion that uh, there's co-evolution at multiple levels to the mutual benefit of the host and the biome and of the multiple species who are in syntrophic relationships. But in addition to co-evolution, there's another process going on, which is just self-organization. That is, things come together and there are emergent patterns, and maybe there's a filtering so that we, the, the ensembles we see are more robust than other ensembles, but it's not a, an evolutionary process in the same sense that we typically think about if we're, if selections going on for, uh, um, for particular types. Um, to some extent, the coevolution and self-organization can be destructive to the host, and to some extent, uh, it can be beneficial. But the fact that this can be destructive also, of course, applies to our own cells. Cancer is an example of that. I mentioned Marty Blazer's work um, already about um, the role of H. pylori and its relationship both to stomach cancer and GERD. Um, tumors are a good example of a breakdown of the public goods, of a breakdown of the commons, in that tumor cells begin to proliferate uh, and to do so ultimately to the harm of the host. So that's a self-organization process. Selection hasn't operated uh, sufficiently to restrain them. Obviously it has to some extent or else we'd be having uh, cancer at much higher rates. Together with Karina, who uh, we'll talk later, but probably not about this, um, and um, uh, George Pacheco, who you see in the center of physicists and game theorists, and David Dingley, a terrific oncologist, um, we've hoped to explore another aspect of the public goods dimensions of tumors in that tumor cells have to produce things like cytokines that are crucial to the growth of the tumor. So it was David's hypothesis that he could, he could engineer um, tumor-like cells that don't produce these, um, and he's done that. And now the question is, can we which is a game theoretic problem, can you get them to spread? This might be a novel way to, to treat the cancer by uh, getting the proliferation of cheater cells that don't produce what's necessary for the tumor to grow. So I talked about temporal patterning. I want to talk about alternative stable states now. This has become a topic of great current interest. Not the first time this has become a topic of current interest, but Martin Steffer's book, 
called Critical Transitions in Nature and Society, which talked about the multiple stable states uh, that could exist under certain conditions, as shown by that diagram on the left. Uh, and um, the early warning indicators that might be associated with the potential for a system to flip from one state to another. Um, Martin has led a, 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 a number of publications uh, on this topic, on early warning signals, and uh, Jeff Gore and his group have been applying this, and I, I imagine we'll hear from Jeff, will we hear from you about um, uh, in coffee breaks and things? But he's not going to talk about it. Uh, and I think this is a very exciting idea that these, uh, that before a transition there might be early warning indicators of those changes. But, uh, but I want to exercise some caution here as well. Uh, I started in this field before almost any of you here, maybe before any of you here, uh, in the late 1960s when René Tom popularized the notion of catastrophe theory. Uh, we spent a lot of time reading those papers, uh, the ways in which systems could transition from one state to another. They became uh, uh, very popular. And then, because of overreach, that is, just because A implies B doesn't mean when you see B, it's because of A. Uh, but people started to, uh, to say, well, it must be this phenomenon going on all over the place. Um, the, the whole subject lost uh, its currency. And uh, I, I, I worry that the, the overreach on early warning indicators which are characteristic of a certain class of transition, could have the same effect. But there are a number of theoretical questions for microbial communities that this raises. Uh, are there alternative stable states in our microbiomes? Or in microbiomes uh, of the microbial systems more generally? Uh, for example, could the early application of antibiotics have a permanent or a nearly permanent effect on community dynamics, or given enough time, would we eventually recover from that? Um, uh, Bruce Levin could uh, answer that question, and probably will a little later. Uh, even if the early effects are transient, could there be long-lasting uh, eco effect, ecosystem effects? Remember that antibiotics are given uh, in agriculture in order to make animals fatter. It works. That's why Marty. Uh, uh, Blazer has argued that that there, there's a, a, an obesity epidemic that, epidemic that to some extent is a, is associated with the use of antibiotics. Uh, we don't know the answer to that. And in the last part, I want to talk about uh, spatial patterns and coupling in space and time. So this is the second goal of the. Uh, of the Simons grant that we got. Uh, how do you understand the importance of the heterogeneity um, in ecological systems and the spatial distribution of resources uh, and consumers uh, and organisms' ability to exploit this? So here's an area that potentially can build on foraging theory from ecology, but it's complicated by problems of detection and uncertainty. For example, one of the most successful sets of equations drawn from mathematics and physics to apply to microbial communities was the work of Evelyn Keller and Lee Siegel long ago. They were interested ultimately in slime molds, um, but that led them to, um, to the study of chemotaxis and the development of equations which to this day are still widely used to describe these systems and I think work very well. But how do you derive these equations? They're not usually there, there are multiple ways, as all, most of you will know, to derive diffusion equations and diffusion-like equations. Uh, one of them is to just look at fluxes across boundaries uh, and write down those equations. But if you want to take into account the fact that you're dealing with individuals and derive equations for the movements of individuals, this was what I was implying uh, earlier on, and find the correct way to derive the continuum limits, um, then there are complications. And in, our, in the Simons grant, because of the great capacity of Roman Stocker's group to make measurements in the field, we want to understand where cells can do um, chemotaxis in terms of what they can detect and how important noise is. Um, many of you uh, um, will know Herbie Levine's work and the, the beautiful work 
that he and Eshel, the late uh, Eshel Ben Jacob did in studying the fantastic emergent spatial patterns in these communities. Well, in ecology, there's a lot of work traditionally on spatial patterns. What you just saw were largely on, uh, in, in Eshel Ben Jacob and Herb Levine's work, um, it, emergent patterns, endogenous patterns in constant environments. But the first thing an ecologist would do would be to map out something like this, where um, this comes originally from the Holdridge diagrams, but this is my late colleague, uh, Robert H. Whitaker, um, in which you look at different regions in terms of their temperature and their humidity and say what kind of vegetation you would expect to appear there. Not which species, but what kinds of vegetation. Where would you get tropical uh, rainforest? Where would you get tundra? Where would you get grassland, et cetera? And to a first approximation, these work very well. Then often within these regions, there's some multiple stable states that are possible. There's some overlap. The, the boundaries are not as sharp uh, as you see in this picture. But we ought to do this uh, at multiple levels for the microbiome. Uh, for example, and um, uh, at, the, at a previous meeting on this topic that I went to at the Wellcome Trust, another Segre, who hoped to be here, Julia Segre, talked about the microbiome of different parts of the skin. Well, that's very different than, of course, than what's in your gut. Most of us, when we think about the microbiome, the first thing we think about is the gut, but there are many other different regions in the body with their own microbial communities. And of course, when you get a cold or something of that sort, or, uh, it, it, it will affect different regions because different microbes are living in different regions of your body. Can we map this out to understand what the community looks like in different parts of the body? And what about globally? Well, there, uh, work has begun on understanding differences in the human microbiome in response, for example, to what people eat in different areas as well as uh, other environmental conditions. So we need a Holdridge diagram for the human body and we need a Holdridge diagram to understand the distribution of the uh, microbial communities across the globe. The idea of endogenous patterns has, um, in any kind of community has always interested theoreticians and the most famous piece of work is that by Alan Turing, who was interested in developmental biology and how an organism can develop um, a homogeneous cell with really no blueprint and just rules for local interactions uh, and no external forces except gravity um, could develop over time. And he proposed an interaction between two species, U here, an activator species, and V, an inhibitor, which have their own dynamics of interaction given by F and G and then diffuse, and diffuse at different rates, U and V. And his idea um, was that um, an initially homogeneous distribution of activator and inhibitor could become destabilized when there's a random perturbation of, say, activator, which stimulates production, uh, causes the activator to rise up, causes the inhibitor to rise up, but then the inhibitor which ought to be dampening it down, if it's got a higher diffuser rate, diffuses the way the activator keeps going. There's inhibitor over here, which, uh, which uh, suppresses activator production, and that breaks symmetry, and uh, patterns can uh, um, emerge from that. So there's been a lot of work. Um, it's not so clear how, how well this works for, uh, for the systems that Turing originally proposed, but people have looked at this in ecological systems. Um, on the left, the, the tiger brush patterns that Ehud Maron and others, uh, and Chris, Chris Klausmeyer have studied, um, and this uh, work on the right that uh, um, Karina led with a number of people here as collaborators in trying to understand the degree to which these patterns might be observed or things like these patterns or these patterns modified by other factors like termite mounts in ecological systems. Early on, Lee Siegel and I and Akira Kubo separately proposed that this might work to understand the patterns of uh, plankton distribution uh, in the oceans. Uh, and we thought about phytoplankton as the activators, zooplankton as the inhibitors. The trouble is that really didn't work very well because um, 
because the zooplankton don't move randomly, so the diffusion model didn't work. And in fact, instead of there being more spread out, as the inhibitor should be, they're the ones that are more patchily distributed. So uh, that led to an attention to collective motion more generally and mathematical approaches to describing those. Going from the individual-based model to the ensemble, my student Danny Cohen, I'm sorry, da Danny Grubbaum, uh, led this um, um, uh, research and later we did work with uh, Glenn Flarell and Don Olson. But what Danny did in his thesis was to start with Newton's laws, force equals mass times acceleration. But the forces were not just the forces inherited from the fluid dynamics and from chemotactic motion, but from individuals moving towards each other. So this is an individual-based model. He did this for every individual, developed the statistical mechanics on the ensemble, and then using some local rules about Poisson arrivals, derived um, Eulerian descriptions. And so um, there are standard ways to do this, um, and uh, um, very few, little of it has been done for microbial communities. The last thing I want to mention was the last thing that Daniel talked about, which is the last bullet in this paper, namely public goods and their role in these systems. Whenever we have, as I said at the beginning, phenomena going on in multiple scales in an evolutionary process, there's potential conflict between what's good for the individuals and what's good for the group, and how do we get to the emergent prop property. So as I said, this is the last part of Daniel's talk. I almost put down the penultimate part because he went from talking about public goods to talking about the emergence of ecosystems, but I would argue, and I think he would too, that that's still a public goods problem. How do we get the emergent properties uh, of the community that sustain everything? So in ecology, there are lots of examples of public goods uh, and common pool resources. I, I don't want to get into the uh, economic distinction between them. Think of them as the same for, for now. Um, the most obvious one is information. When you have collective search going on, some individuals are foragers and some are simply um, uh, scavengers on that. Um, how, how much of the available nutrient pool do you use up? If things are well mixed, you better use it up now or else your competitors are going to use it up. But if there's a structured environment, you might actually leave things uh, to use later. In particular, if you have sidereophores that chelate iron or something else that holds it available to you, uh, that might be a good thing to do. But once it's out there, a neighbor can still steal it, so there is the same sort of conflict that Daniel talked about. Nitrogen fixation poses exactly the same problem. Individuals fi uh, fix nitrogen. Let's say a plant does it, it's in their leaves, the leaves drop to the ground, neighboring trees can utilize it. Antibiotics are classic public goods problems in two ways. One is um, in, in nature, if bacteria, for example, produce antibiotics, then the um, and and we'll, I'll talk about this a little bit more in just a second. Uh, other individuals can take advantage of that by, uh, uh, by being resistant to it, but uh, still benefiting from the competitive effect on nature. And we all know about the, the problem of antibiotics in, um, in our societies and the overuse of those antibiotics. And bacteria produce extracellular polymers that allow them to form biofilms um, and many of you said you're working on quorum sensing, and th these also produce an extracellular matrix for growth. In the paper with George Hagstrom, we talk in particular about syntrophy, uh, and the, the point that, the, um, which uh, others have documented, that the, the often one finds a strong correlation with the genes for production of different extracellular enzymes. So there seems to be some sort of high-level cooperation going on. Uh, it's been called the Black Queen hypothesis that different li lineages either specialize in public goods production or in cheating. So this is very analogous to the producer scrounger um, literature in, in ecology, behavioral ecology. Bacteria also produce toxins to which they're immune. But as Bruce and Lynn Chow showed, when they tried to evolve this um, in a well-mixed medium, it was very difficult to do because cheaters arose. However, and this is work with um, 
I actually used to give Bruce credit for it, but he told me I shouldn't do that. Uh, the, the Rick Durant and I built a spatial model that showed that if you had the cheaters um, together with, with the wild types and the, uh, the toxin producers in the same culture, um, in, a, in a spatially structured environment, you could get coexistence of all three types. The problem is that the colicin, colicin is the toxin producer, uh, allows the, uh, um, the, the individuals that produce it to outcompete the colon sensitive types. Um, but the, um, the type that's resistant can outcompete the producer because it doesn't pay all the price of production and still gets the benefits, but it loses in direct competition with the colon sensitive, colon sensitive uh, type, so you get a non hierarchical competition. In a spatial environment, the three types chase each other around and you get coexistence. Uh, and this was followed up by Ben Kerr and his collaborators who did experimental work building on our, uh, our model uh, and uh, demonstrated that this can really go on in nature. And finally, as many of you know much better than I, uh, bacteria also cooperate. They produce these public goods I already mentioned, the extracellular polymers. Uh, that are important for quorum sensing. And so with Kerry Nadell, who was a joint student of, between me and Bonnie Bassler, and Jalik Xavier and Kevin Foster, uh, we examined this problem some years ago, um, taking into account that some bacterial types turn on the production of this um, extracellular polymer at high densities, some do it at low densities, some potentially do it constitutively, some don't do it at all. So we put these types into competition, uh, allowed nutrients to, to flow, uh, and watched under what conditions one could get the production of these extracellular polymers in relationship to mixing, et cetera. So there's a lot of potential uh, for modeling to understand these problems. I stuck these slides in to, uh, after listening to Daniel's talk um, because the sorts of questions that come up came up several centuries ago in economics where um, Adam Smith, whom you see pictured on the left, uh, set up against Charles Darwin here, uh, talked about the invisible hand. He said that the baker, by pursuing his own interests, frequently promotes the interests of society more effectually than when he really intends to promote it. This is an idea that at least uh, perfuses many notions of uh, economic organization uh, that societies will organize themselves. Uh, this is sort of um, a very conservative philosophy. Let the, the free market operate and that everything will work out. Yes. Of course, we learned in 2008, we had learned before, that the invisible hand that Adam Smith talked about doesn't protect society, that one needs some balance. So I think it's an open <laughs> question. Uh, the degree to which these sort of considerations apply to microbial systems. So let me just summarize. Um, collective phenomena and emergence characterize all complex adaptive systems, uh, from microbial communities to the biosphere. There's a potential for critical transitions. A fundamental challenge for those with mathematical or physical in inclinations is to learn how to scale from the microscopic to the macroscopic, and to understand in particular consensus formation and how collective phenomena emerge, but also characteristic of these systems is conflict between individuals and collectives and the public goods problems that they raise. Uh, and so finally, I just want to go back to where I was at the beginning and to say that I think methods from not only mathematics and physics, but ecology and evolution have a lot of potential. And Bruce has been arguing this for, for decades, ever since I was in high school. Um, to inform the study of these systems. But I also want to argue that all four of these disciplines can be inspired by these new applications. There are lots of examples in mathematics uh, in particular, where applications, for example, for biology have inspired uh, new ideas in mathematics. So uh, it's very timely to be effective.